Hello, this is Mr. White, and this video is on composing trig and inverse trig functions. Now, when you compose functions, what you get are called composite functions. And if you don't remember what that is, we did study it earlier in the year. Do you remember taking a function and plugging the entire function into another function? Well, that was what composite functions were. And we also wrote it in that Fog and Goff format. I was not as crazy about that, but I did want you to at least be familiar with it if you see it in a textbook, either in this class or sometime down the road. Um, so that's composite functions. And if you ask any calculus student about something called the chain rule, chain rule is all about the calculus of dealing with functions within functions. And any calculus student will tell you that that is something that we use all the time in calculus. So composite functions is a big deal. Um, last video, I don't think I, I don't remember if I referred to it as composite functions, but we did deal with some composite functions. Um, notice that in that case, uh, in the last video, we started with an angle, which then got plugged into uh, the tangent function in this case, which gave us a ratio. And then when we took the arctan of that, our final answer brought us back to an angle. So the final answer in this case, the arctangent of the tangent of 5 pi over 4, um, turns out that was pi over 4, as we demonstrated in the last video. And we see that our final answer was indeed an angle. Well, we're going to reverse that in this video. We're going to um, reverse things here uh, uh, such that our final answer turns out to be a ratio. So let me just leave this up on the screen for contrast and go ahead and write what our first example is going to be here. Um, our first example is going to be, let's say, instead of an arc function on the outside or an inverse function, let's just use the regular old secant function. And then plugged into that, we'll do an inverse trig function. So let's do arc sine of x. And so the first thing uh, I really want to point out to you is that this is a little bit different than in the last um, uh, video. In this case, arcs, or in this case, x is a ratio. And I know that because I can only take arc sine of a ratio. It makes no sense to take arc sine of an angle. Now, when I take arc sine of that ratio, what I get as an output is an angle. And hopefully this is making sense. And you're saying, yes, that's consistent with what I already know. So I need you to remember, this is a big deal to remember in this process, that this whole thing that I'm circling right now is an angle. If you forget that, this problem is going to become very confusing. And then when I take secant of that angle, our final answer will be a ratio in contrast to what we did in the last video, OK? So even though on first glance this looks like something we did last video, there is, there are, is that fundamental difference there. All right, so let me move some of that off the screen. And like I said, this is going to be our first example. So let me get the old stuff out of the way and bring on the new header here. And the instructions that you're going to be given, and these are the same instructions you're going to see on the homework as well as on my uh, assessments. You're going to be asked to find an algebraic expression equivalent to the given expression. I'll admit that on first glance, that, that doesn't sound, you're probably thinking, huh, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to show you and expect to, to see those exact words on an assignment and a test. OK, so here's the thing. Here's how we start off. I'm going to start off by temporarily ignoring the stuff on the outside. And that's, that's similar to what I suggested in the last video. Let's just focus on arc sine of x. And let's remind ourselves that x is the ratio, right? So let me just remind you of that ratio. And I want to draw a picture of the angle. Remember, this is an angle. And I want to say, what does that angle look like whose sine is equal to x? Well, let me draw it over here. I'm going to draw just some, some triangle. I'm going to call this theta. That's the angle that I'm referring to, theta. And if its sine is equal to x, let me just put it up here. And then I'll suggest you pause the video if you need to to make sure that this makes sense. But this is a picture representing the situation we're dealing with. This angle right here is the angle whose sine is equal to x, or x over 1, if you prefer to think of it that way. 
So hopefully that makes sense. Um, now we might ask ourselves, hopefully it's almost intuitive at this point, we want to know what is the length of this third leg of the triangle? And we will simply use our Pythagorean theorem. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that right here. I'd invite you, again, pause if necessary and make sure you agree with my result. But I'm going to put square root of 1 minus x squared, and that's just a result of using the Pythagorean theorem. Now, why did I need to do that? Well, because remember what I'm going to do with this angle theta? I'm not going to just stop there. I'm going to take the secant of that angle theta. So again, I, I repeat, it's critically important to keep reminding yourself that this was a ratio and that this whole quantity is an angle. And if, again, if you forget that, this problem becomes confusing very quickly. So secant of that angle, I just look at my picture and I say, hmm, secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, right? So looking at where I have theta, hypotenuse over adjacent is going to give me 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. And guess what? That is my final answer. If you're thinking, hey, is that all? That wasn't too bad. Well, good. Yes, that is all. And I hope it wasn't too bad. That's my final answer. OK, uh, let's do one more just to make sure you got that. How about the cosecant of inverse cotangent of x over 5? So notice I, I follow that same structure, a regular trig function, a non-inverse trig function on the outside, a trig function on the inside, the same instructions. And let's start with a picture. Uh, or let's start by, again, ignoring the outer function. And let's start with a picture at this point. Who, let's, draw, let's think of an angle, this whole thing is an angle, whose cotangent, whose adjacent over opposite is x over 5. So I just draw a triangle. Notice that in this exercise, in this type of problem, we're not worrying about the xy plane anymore. We're not thinking about on xy coordinates and positive and negative side lengths. Um, so we get a temporary break from that kind of thinking. But again, I'm going to say this angle theta which is the co inverse cotangent x over 5, it needs to have a cotangent of x over 5. So that means that it's adjacent over opposite is x over 5. And I draw that on the picture like this, right? So hopefully you can anticipate what that hypotenuse is going to be. Pythagorean theorem again it says x squared plus 5 squared square rooted. And now I say, OK, I want to take the cosecant of that angle theta. The cosecant is going to be hypotenuse over opposite, right? So I look at my picture, and the hypotenuse over opposite is going to be square root x squared. Now, whether you write plus 5 squared or whether you just write 25, I don't really care. Same thing over the opposite, which is 5. And that is our final answer. So what I would like to see on your assignment, as well as your test, is I would like to see that picture there. Y even if you get to the point where you feel like you could do this in your head, please don't. Draw the picture. As usual, my reasoning is that if you make a mistake, I can at least see your thinking a little better when you, when you draw the picture and award some partial credit if, if uh, need be. OK, that's, that's it. Now, given that that was pretty quick, I can't, I can't resist. I got to indulge a little bit into a little bit of a calculus insight. So um, let me give you a quick calculus connection, which hopefully some of you will find interesting and, and will look forward to calculus a little more. So in doing so, let me give you a quick recap of the inverse trig functions and how they look graphically. What you see on the screen right now is just our regular sine wave, right? y equals sine of x. And so something that we should have discussed in class by now is how do, what, what does the inverse sine graph look like? So hopefully we've discussed that already. But as a quick recap, we imagine the line y equals x, and we reflect the original function over that line y equals x. And that's what our inverse uh, function looks like. However, the key word is function. It has to be a function, right? So hopefully you're recalling that we had to restrict um, that function. We had to cut it back until it passed the vertical line test. And we cut it back that far. And I'll just put it in bold there. That is where our inverse sine graph looks, 
came from. So that's a quick little uh, pre-calc recap. Um, let me get rid of some of this stuff here. All right. Um, now, one thing that we concern ourselves quite a bit with, and in fact, I'd say we spend about half our time in calculus worrying about tangent lines and what their slopes are. Now, if you want to know why do we concern ourselves with such strange abstract matters as the slope of a tangent line, well, you'll have to take calculus to, to, for us to answer that question. But if you look on the screen there, that's the, um, the tangent line. And I notice that the tangent line is evolving as I move the, this point, the point of tangency along the curve. And I want to know, I want to be able to calculate the slope of that tangent line at any point along that curve. If this is the first you're ever hearing about what we do in calculus, this probably seems awfully strange, but just bear with me here. So let me just pick an arbitrary point. I'm going to pick this point right here. Notice that the x value is about 0.5. And let's say I want to figure out what the slope of that curve is. Well, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you the formula that we, um, and then in calculus, we would develop this and, and try to make sense out of why this is what it is. But I'm going to go ahead and just tell you at this point, as a little bit of a teaser, that if you want to know the slope of a tangent line of the inverse sine function, it turns out that the slope is given by this formula. And hey, that looks awfully familiar, doesn't it? That was the answer to our first exercise, our first example. Now, if you're still going, huh, I don't get it. What does that mean? Let me take it a step further. I, I said I wanted to find the slope when x equals 0.5. That was just the point I randomly chose here. Um, so let me say at x equals 5, or I'm sorry, 0.5, um, or let me, let me write as a fraction, 1 half. The slope equals, I would just plug that 1 half into that, into that crazy formula, which just coincidentally happened to be the answer to our first example, right? And that equals 1 over, this, this denominator is the square root of 1 minus a fourth. So that's square root of 3 fourths. And if I simplify that, do a couple little simplifications, hopefully that you're looking at this and making sense out of that. That equals 2 over root 3. And that turns out to be a little bit bigger than 1. In fact, I'm running out of room here, but I'll say that approximately equals 1.154. And if we look at our picture, that hopefully that, that makes, kind of makes sense. Doesn't it look like the rise over the run of that line is a little bit bigger than one? This rise is just a little bit bigger than the run. So it seems reasonable that the slope would be 1.154. So there's a little bit of a teaser of some of what we do in calculus. And again, if you want to know why do we do such things, well, take calculus next year. All right. Um, hopefully the pre-calc part of this lesson, though, was, was pretty manageable. Um, here are your exercises to try. Pause the video. I'll show the answers here in just a moment. All right, let's bring on the answers. Here's the first one. Square root of 1 plus 16x squared. Now, if you had that over 1, that's fine. You don't have to. And likewise, if you had square root of 1 plus parentheses 4x, close parentheses squared. That's fine, too. However, if you didn't have these parentheses, that would be incorrect. And I trust you see why. Uh, the second one is x over square root of 9 minus x squared. And again, you could have put 3 squared instead of 9. Perfectly fine. And the last one, running a little bit short on room, but there's the last one. 6 over square root of x squared minus 36. As always, if any of that didn't make sense, please come on by to office hours, um, and let's clear it up.